recorded in sinfully sunny Las Vegas, Nevada, Avon Pop Bookstore presents Interviews. professor of law at Boston University, a former law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the United States Supreme Court, and author of six previous books, including Our Non-Christian Nation, The Odd Clauses, and the novel Turtle in the Balance. Today we'll be talking about Weed Rules, his latest book, Blazing the Way to a Just and Joyful Marijuana Policy. Join us now, Jay Wexler. Jay hey. Wexler, it is a pleasure to finally meet you in person. Um, yeah, your uh, your work is fantastic from what I've seen. What you've done with the, uh, the Satanic Temple, they were great, and I oh, love yeah. that. Thank you. The so, Satanic let's... Temple was in Boston this uh, for the this for Satan Con. Yeah, sold out <laughs> apparently. <laughs> it was very <laughs> people are <were> freaking out. <laughs> I love them though. Man. Yeah, yeah. Well. Let's get started by just telling us a little bit about your background, for those who uh, don't know who Jay Wexler is. Uh, sure. Um, I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, north of Boston. Uh, I live in Boston now, but not because I uh, wanted to come back home necessarily, but because this is where I got a job. I got a job at Boston University in 2001, and I've been teaching law at BU ever since, um, mostly constitutional law and environmental law, some, and uh Got into cannabis law about seven years ago or so, and uh, started teaching that to the students, and uh, and that's what led me to this book. Um, I could tell I got all sorts of other things I could say about my background. I, I was a terrible. Uh, I, uh, I well, I'll just put this one thing in there. I was um, the uh, uh, second and a half string center on my freshman football high school football team, so that's. Uh, Interesting. I don't know if your reader, if your customers, you know, would think that's important, but uh, <laughs> but I was really excited to make the team. But I was so terrible. I got, I got into eight plays the entire year, and I uh, got my, one penalty called on me, and uh, and and fumbled once. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yeah, that, that that covers, I guess, some of the highlights. <laughs> well. I, <laughs> You, you, yeah, I mean, I always wanted to. I always wanted to write for sitcoms or something, but it, uh, but I don't have that kind of uh, that particular kind of humor. So it never, never kind of worked out. So I went the law professor route and tried to get humor in the back door, kind of. Which you pull off. I've seen some of your videos, and uh, <laughs> you're quite entertaining. If the lawyer thing doesn't work out, you can always do a little stand up. <laughs> I thought about trying. Right. Well, let's get right into it with your book. Read rules. You know, you had 10 criteria uh, for your policy and how you think this could help roll out in the future and how we can make it better. I think we should just get right into those. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, these. Are, so I, I, part of the books, the idea of the book was to uh, kind of maybe make theoretical sort of some of the some of the uh, uh, or, or, um to policy debates um, uh, by by sort of uh, abstracting away from the specifics and trying to figure out what the the uh, the, the sort of fundamental uh, goals are or could be of marijuana policy. So that's where these sort of ten criteria come from. Uh, I, I, I'll see if I can remember them all. I might not be able to, uh, but I should. Right, I should be able to. Right. Uh, so equity, ease of access. Uh, um, uh, well, environmentalism, that was one. <laughs> I, have, I have a book somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, undermining the illicit market. Um, uh, 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 rationality is one of them. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Do you remember? <laughs> I, I, I didn't go grab it. But, no. <laughs> um, we're, we're hold on. Uh, public health. Oh, well, public health. Right. I always forget. Public that. health. It's not my it's not my main uh, my main uh, thing. There's a sort of economic uh, market freedom. Market freedom. Is yeah. One of them. Local control is one of them. Um, 
So how far have I gotten? Normalization, I think, is is, yeah. uh, is one of them. And that's sort of, in, in some ways, my most important view. Let's see if I mix anything, miss anything. Oh, environmental protection. I like to always uh, remind people about that as an environmental yeah. law uh, person. Uh, yeah, cannabis can be can be harmful uh, in some ways to uh, to the environment. And so we just have to be aware of that and take yeah. uh, and take measures uh to 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 lessen that as much as we can revenue maximization and i think that's it i think those are the 10 yeah, yeah. Sh- should i say them again let me just go through them real quick equity public health ease of access revenue maximization environmental protection rationality market freedom reduction of the illicit market local control and normalization those are the ten. and the thing is they um you know if you try to maximize one with some policy decision um, uh, say to imp- improve equity in the industry, you're gonna you're gonna undermine other interests like market freedom, and so uh, and and it gets even more complicated than that, where you can maximize four and uh, three other ones fall away. And the and the point of the whole thing is that it's really complicated to 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 try to do marijuana policy uh, at all because there are so many competing interests, and trying to solve one problem always creates other problems, and so. Basically, you have to think about what's most important to you. Uh, you know, if you're put your put yourself in the in the position of a regulator or even a voter, right? What what are the things that you care about? Uh, because there are going to be trade offs, and so you have to know which things are most more important and which things are less important uh, in order to be able to make those trade offs. Yeah, I, and I think the education is still a huge thing, and the stigma from the drug war is huge still. You know, I, I got a little story real quick. My mom, yeah. I've, been, I've been writing for cannabis magazines for a little over a decade, and I've been using cannabis since I was 18. I did a video, a, 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 a podcast with a local hip hop star here in Vegas, and and uh, we talked about smoking a blunt. So my mom said, you got to be careful putting that out there in a video. You know, people might get, you might get in trouble. And I said, mom, well, the state's legal. And I've been writing for 10 years about <laughs> cannabis. It's pretty clear what I do. In fact, we had a cannabis company, my wife and I in California. <laughs> yeah. So it's, but the stigma, you know, it just stuck with her. And that was just a trigger for her. And she was, oh, be careful. And, you know, it's, 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 in, it's, uh, it's still happening all over. In so many ways, like, like, um, it's just, uh, I, you know, so I can only speak about Boston and, you know, my my, uh, you know, uh, sort of professional context and everything. And it still feels really like I'm all by myself. Like, I mean, there are people, other people who I work with who use weed, I think some, but nobody talks about it really. And it's always, you know, kind of a j- joke, you know, people have to make the Cheetos jokes and stuff. Uh, and uh it's really so so even you know even if nobody like thinks i'm a bad person for doing it or thinks you know i'm gonna get in trouble it's still like a weird thing it's not like drinking a glass of wine and 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 i that drives me crazy so that's part of the reason why uh i'm i wrote the book and why i want to go around and talk about it to people you know it's just not that big a deal uh and it's so much better than alcohol so uh, you know i mean for most you know, users of cannabis, I think would agree with that. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, some people shouldn't use cannabis and some people don't like cannabis and that's fine, but yeah. you know, so what? Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't use it. And, but um, yeah, you can, and, and you know, uh, but in particular, what, uh, one thing, a specific thing that drives me crazy that I talk about in the book uh, um, is the, the lack of anywhere to, <laughs> to use marijuana. Like, yeah. Of course, you could use an edible anywhere, and you could s- smoke outside. Uh, you know, these days nobody's gonna, you know, uh, if you're white, anyways, nobody's gonna arrest you. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, but still, like I, I had climb out my window to the fire escape is how I use my, my yeah. cannabis, or I go out in the alleyway um, behind the dumpster, and like there's no place to go socially to, you know, unless you have. If you're in a community and you have friends who do who do use it and you have they have outdoors or whatever, then you can do it. But but I'm not in that situation really because I'm I'm you know with a bunch of professors and nobody seems to want to smoke weed, so I'm by myself and in the dumpster all the time. So yeah. So uh, uh, I hope the lounges. Uh, you know, I'm doing a couple of events at cannabis lounges, one in Denver and one in. Uh, in San Francisco, and I'm sure yeah. they'll be in Vegas soon enough. But they're, but as you told me, right, they're not, they're not there yet. Uh, yeah. uh, 
and yeah, we still got a, there. We still got a couple of uh, well, once it once people start establishing them, I think it'll take a solid year for it all to get set up. The sheriffs mm-hmm. and the police are still nervous here about it. I was at a, a city council meeting uh, recently about doing a pop up vendor cannabis license for um, those who've been infected by the drug war that haven't haven't had the uh, money to get into the industry because it just keeps getting more expensive. And the sheriff said, uh, look, we don't know how the lounges are going to go. We don't want to have these pop-up events at big you know, concerts and stuff. But again, you know, we've seen this plant for a long time, and it keeps people mellow, and yet they'll have a bar on every corner and a liquor store, you know, every four feet here in Vegas. So Right, you'd think the sheriffs are bleeding, like, please switch, yeah. switch yeah. to weed. Um, are they afraid of people driving driving with it? Or, or? I, I think I think that's their their the one safety that they're the most concerned about. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, I mean that's a, a, a that's a, good, a legitimate concern. Like I'm not one of those people who right. think, like thinks I can drive with. I mean I know people. Some people think they can drive with cannabis, and and maybe they can. I can't, and so I know that a lot of people can't. Uh, and so we don't. I don't think all things being equal, want people driving high. But you know. Uber solved this problem, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Taxis too, but uh, but um, you just get a ride share or, or, yeah. or take a subway or if you're near one of those. Totally. Like you get uh, yeah. Boston. yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, yeah. That's the simplest and easiest. I, I think also the health concern has been blown out of proportion quite a bit, and I think that that will calm down over the years. That people will realize that you know it's 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 not going to ruin your liver like alcohol. And right, I'm using it to save my liver. Like exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope it hope it works. Yeah. Like, well, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the, uh, the the corporate takeover of cannabis that worries me. And yeah. uh, you know, we my my wife and I had a, a cannabis company in California. It was an edibles company during the medical era. And, we made a lot of enemies with the cannabis growers because we were trying to get adult use legalized so that, you know, people get out of jail. That to me, you know, I can smoke by the dumpster, but if someone's in jail for cannabis, that it was just ridiculous. Absolutely. But, so, we, so we ended up getting that passed, but then Governor Brown came in and made it a vertical and, and allowed big companies to come in. Well, we had a moratorium in the in our bill that said back then, and we changed that in a deal. Killed our company killed a lot of small mom and pops that have been doing it for years successfully. And that that was kind of a bummer. And and now I'm seeing some other, you know, Cure Leaf has uh John Bonner, uh, the old head of stick, and they're trying to make it so that states that legalize it, they don't give out more licenses. They're trying to they're trying to monopolize that. And that scares me too. Yeah, capping licenses overall seems like a bad idea. Capping the number of licenses that any one entity can own, which is what we've tried to do in Massachusetts, uh, it seems like a, it could be, you know, if it works, could be a way of, uh, of stemming the tide of big weed and, and, and allowing for, uh, for, for more local, uh, you know, smaller businesses, which is, which is what I think most people, you know, yeah you know, other than the big companies want, um, I don't, you know, every state's a little different on this and it's good. Then it's going to all change when we get interstate commerce or federal legalization, uh, if assuming that happens. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's a real issue. It's a real problem. I know in Massachusetts, um, we, we have, there's a new, a new group called the Parabola Center, which, uh, which is run by Shalene Title, who, uh, was our first one of our first commissioners and a and a and a, uh, a, 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 a huge equity advocate uh, in the industry, really like a rock star in that area. And and she she pro- she could have if she wanted to could have cashed in you know after the commissioner position, but it was not not what it, in, at all in her DNA. And she started this new institute. And the thing is, it's about anti monopolization. It's about exactly this problem. And they're and they're coming up with guidelines and you know trying to influence legislatures to come up with rules that will that will reduce the chance of the of the of this looking like you know the Budweiser and Miller cores taking yeah. over weed yeah. which i think uh, you know i mean it's going to ha- happen a little uh, without a, 
I don't know what you think. I mean, I, you're, it might be closer to this. I think it's going to happen for sure. I just wish they would allow more licenses for mom and pop operations. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can go up against Coca-Cola, but, you know, I mean, if they have all the shelf space and the cannabis industry is starting to charge for self- shelf space now, like, you know, their Whole Foods or something, which, again, uh, kills the mom and pops. So, yeah, it's that's a tough one for sure. And I'm glad that someone's working on it. And, you know, it's yeah, crazy. I think so. Here in here yeah, in Nevada, towards federal. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, here in Nevada too, a lot of the companies now. I mean, it's 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 great to own a license because that's what's selling. And then a lot of these companies are in Canada, they're in Russia, they're in, you know Colorado came and bought a bunch too. So they're taking the money out of our state, which is not a good uh-huh. thing, you know. And then they're not paying their employees that much. They're keeping it all minimum wage, and so it's it's just another bad corporate move I see that the industry is doing right now. So I'm hoping we can stop that or at least change it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, interstate commerce makes it harder because, uh, you know, if you can keep it within the state and you can kind of uh, prefer your own, uh, you know, uh, residents for, for licenses and things like that, you can, you know, help, uh, help the, uh, the local community be, you know, take a big part of the industry. Unfortunately, under the, constitutionally, it's not really okay uh, to, 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 you know, prefer your own residents, unless Congress were to say it, that states could do that. And, and Congress could do that. So this is all you know, the dormant commerce clause, which is the, the uh, you know, the, the weird constitutional provision that, take, that it happens to be so important, actually, for the cannabis uh, uh, industry. Yeah. And, uh, and, and courts are starting to, to realize that, that's, that a lot of the regulations in the cannabis uh, world are, are problematic under the, that dormant commerce clause. And so we're gonna, we've already seen some unraveling of these kind of local regulations, and we're going to see more. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see the courts actually open up interstate commerce in cannabis, uh, independent of the, the Congress, um, uh, which will have all sorts of, who know, you know, hard to predict effects. And so, you know, people like Shaleen and, and others are looking forward to that because now is the time we got to start thinking, you know, once we get interstate commerce or federal legalization, how is that going to change uh, the industry, and what can we do? to promote the, the interest that we care about. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I, I hate to say it, but we're going to have to get a new president and vice president because, you know, Biden, is not, I don't think he's going to help at all. He's all talk. Um, and, you know, and that, and he, he, he yeah. put the rave act, which was really disappointing too. put that through, which was that you can't have drug testing on any, any place. So concerts don't, uh, venues don't uh, have any special, drug testing places and and that has killed a lot of people over the years and i think the fact that his son has been so uh so much of a partier that he's he just is talking now he's not going to do anything for it yeah, so with the mail, yeah, I think it's, right. uh yeah so at least 2024 uh <laughs> I, I don't know it's just so frightening to think about uh what could happen in 2024 yeah. i don't even want to go there it's but it's so close <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll take the I'll take uh, Marianne Will- Williamson over right now. New age is okay by me, <laughs> and she's a smart lady too. Very so, good. yeah. Oh uh, well, I I love you. Came up the term careful exuberance. Do you think that? Tell us a little bit about how you see that rolling out. Yeah. So what 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 um, finally clicked while I was thinking was thinking about writing the book and then actually starting to write the book is. There's a theme uh, with all the things that drive me crazy uh, about cannabis policy, which is that they're all kind of uh, prohibition hangovers in a sense. It's there's sort of like states have said, yeah, we can legalize. Uh, yes, people should not be in jail for cannabis, and I agree that is the most important thing. Uh, and so, so I'm so so glad about legal you know legalization for that reason and for other reasons too. But but um, it's it states in all sorts of ways just seem like they're they're saying uh, you can ha- it's we can it can be legal but we're not excited about it we're not going to make it easy for you to use we're not going to make it easy for you to advertise your products and 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 all of that sounds in um, w- what the policy wonks call grudging tolerate toleration um, which is you know a phrase in the drug policy world uh, and and uh, and I think that's right I think the states 
they don't say it. They don't say we're going to grudgingly tolerate cannabis, but that's basically what they've, they've done. And my argument is we should undo all that and replace uh, 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 that model with what I call careful exuberance. And I don't know if that's the best phrase or not. I, I went through several, oh, I uh, several of them. <laughs> I mean, cautious, cautious sounds better than careful, but I don't think it's quite right. Like, I don't want to be cautious. I, careful right. sounds more like so careful because, yes, cannabis has... Uh, you know, there's some some dangers to cannabis and, and some people shouldn't use cannabis and we should be careful about going into it, getting in, you know, legalizing a new industry and all. I mean, there are some issues we have to be attentive to, but but exuberant because it's such a great thing that finally after these, uh, uh, you know, so many decades of unscientific and racist prohibition, we are now, you know, finally seeing uh, the light and saying that this is a, uh, uh, a recreational choice that is, uh, is, is okay. It's okay to choose it. And, uh, and it's making a lot of people really happy and uh, really joyous. And that's a good thing. And we should be happy about it. And, uh, and if it, you know, undermines the, you know, I like alcohol too, but uh, but but we could use with uh, do with less. I certainly could do with less. And uh, and so cannabis is makes me we should be exuberant about that, too. I think that uh, that we have a safer, you know, cooler. <laughs> I mean, I just like I'm biased, like there's no getting around it. Like and I say that very clearly. <laughs> yeah, in the book. Like, yeah. I like weed a lot, like yeah. I think it's better than most other things. And it's uh, made my life uh, better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And uh, and so states should should embrace it more, uh, uh, embrace legalization more, let let companies advertise um, and show people actually enjoying the product that's being advertised, for example. Crazy, I know. Uh, and uh, and people should not be fired because they use cannabis off the job and police shouldn't be able to search your house because they smell cannabis outside the house. When Take their kids. All that that doesn't mean anything anymore. And, and, and very, and some other things that I've talked about in the book. So careful exuberance, not uh, a grudging tolerance is my, my, yeah. my motto. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I would hope that, and I, we didn't see this in California, but I would hope that when a state legalizes, they work with people who have been in the industry, even on the underground level, because California did not do that. And it took them a long time to figure things out. You know, I, I know, I know. You think that the California Commission, Cannabis Commission, was was decent, and they were, you know, I, we tried working with them, and they were fine. But they just were, you know, you can't go into one industry and then hire a CEO from Pepsi or a CEO from some other that has no idea. They're just seeing numbers and money, and that that kills it, you know. And it, it was really disappointing on, on that level. It took them a yeah. long time to write out their bills too, as an edible company. You know, that you had to have your money in it. You had to have your place where you're going to do it, your commercial kitchen. And it doesn't even mean you're going to get a license. And it took them over a year to do that. And so, you know, that just people couldn't survive. They couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I uh, I did live in California for three years, many, many years ago. So I have a little a little uh, uh, understanding of California's uniqueness. Um, but I but I know that on this issue, California really is uh, is quite quite unique because of the legacy growers and uh and and the difficulty of uh of getting you know, people to use the uh uh the legal uh right just to go go legal when there are all sorts of taxes and regulations and also so there are lots of problems in california i think that are i don't know if they're totally unique for california but they're definitely more more uh, relevant uh, salient in california we don't have that quite quite that in massachusetts um so i'm a little uh, I'm, I'm actually look, going to California tomorrow. I'm doing an event in Berkeley and then I'm doing another one in San Francisco. And I'm, I'm actually looking forward to, to talking to people in California and learning uh, more about the specific issues there because it is so big, unique, and important. Yeah, yeah. We, we have been out of California for five years here in Vegas. And, and I, I've tried not to pay attention sometimes because it's, you know... You don't want to get that emotional about it. But um, uh -huh. yeah, I, and again, you know, Amanda Ryman... As a friend of ours, she's been in the drug policy world for a very long time. Her opinion was that just like when they first did dispensaries, open up dispensaries, that it'll just take some time for everything to work its way out. 
But, you know, I get upset when I see companies like, you know, Anheuser-Busch or, you know, these big companies who spent a lot of money on camp, the campaign against marijuana plantation. They gave money to these places to stop it. And now to see them wanting to get in, it's just like, how how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's our, that's, yeah. yeah, that's our capitalism. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, let's see. I, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, you had top three of your um, criteria that you really liked. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about those if we haven't already covered them. So you yeah. you mentioned health wasn't at the top, but which were your top three? Yeah. So um, so ease of access is uh, is really important. Equity is really important, and normalization is really important. Uh, I think those my those are my top three. Are those my top. They yeah. certainly uh, you know at the moment they're my top three. I think they're my top three in the book too. Um, uh, yeah. Those so equity is is uh, paramount, uh, and uh, and and I think people are you know coming to that have have reach that I, a lot most people i think have reached the uh, un- understanding that that is paramount at least among the people i talk to i mean not the big companies obviously but but among policy reformers uh i think you know the the need to expunge records uh uh to to uh to make sure that people harmed by the drug war can be uh you know play important roles in in the industry and to uh, be in positions of power on cannabis boards and also in uh, license holders uh, and employees. I mean, all of that is extremely uh, critical and sort of stands above everything else. Like that, that that's uh, st- strikes me as the most important. But once we get that, you know, once once we're working on that, I think also the ease of access. Uh, like we should be, people should be able to get the products they want. Uh, they should know, be able to find out where to get them through advertising. Uh, and they should be able to, you know, access includes the ability to use it, I think. And so there should be places to use it. Um, uh, and we shouldn't, people shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, be worried about police or worried about their job, right? They should, if they want to use cannabis, they should be able to get the stuff and use it. Um, so that to me, is critical, and then that goes kind of hand in hand with normalization, which which uh, is is just is sort of the goal, the ultimate goal uh, for me. Like I'd like to see you know we be just as you know not boring, but you know just like yeah yeah I use weed. What do you I use? Yeah. Okay, I use weed. Uh, all right, I'll have this joint in in between. You know, really what. I'll be happy when when there are restaurants that normally have a cannabis course between yeah. uh, between dinner and dessert, Absolutely. which would be such a perfect idea. It seems to me so many advantages to that. Um, but you know, like uh, yes, can I get you a a, a cognac or uh, or you know we have these three strains. Choose yeah. Uh, um, you know, a little take an hour before dessert, regain your hunger. But anyway, so 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 just making. Uh, cannabis a normal thing that people you know that there's no stigma you can talk about it you can use it go to the party and use it and nobody cares and that's like uh, ultimately the the goal I think um, that I that I'm hoping for yeah I think we're we're definitely ahead there it's it's funny to say boring because I interviewed John Waters a handful of years ago and we talked a little bit about cannabis he says well now that it's legal it's just boring so yeah whatever <laughs> and I thought that was <laughs> really? great. John Waters is a huge Satanic Temple fan yeah. too. Yeah, we talked about <laughs> it. Good, we talked about good. that too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's 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 an amazing man for sure. Well, I also got to put some responsibility on the dispensaries because for a long time they looked like Apple stores with only a handful mm. of products, you know, and they weren't care- bringing on new products. And that was back in the medical years. Still, they, you know, it, I know we got Planet Thirteen here in Vegas that's really big, and they're they're trying to blow it up. But what people don't realize, too, is when you start monopolizing, then you get white label. So it might have a different package. It might be from a different company, but they're all using the same manufacturers, the same growers. So then that becomes a, a bit of a, an issue for quality and for uniqueness. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. How many How many dispensaries are there in, uh, in Vegas? Oh. I end up always going to the same one because it's near the strip and I can walk to it. But I, uh, yeah, uh, 
maybe not this time I'm staying in a different place. So, uh, so, so I'll maybe we'll find a different place. We'll see. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know anymore. I used to deliver Vegas cannabis magazines to them. Uh, that was a few years ago. And, uh-huh. and then I get all my cannabis. I review products for Vegas cannabis. So I haven't had to go to a dispensary in a while. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a nice gig. <laughs> yeah. You know, someone's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well listen um you're gonna be here next week thursday may 11th at 7 p.m and can't wait yeah and and we're Uh are you there yep i'm here okay we're running out of time on our end so yeah i appreciate you spending a little time here and we can get into more when you're you're out next week but uh, people can come see you in person at 7 p.m at avant pop bookstore and pick up your book we'll have copies available yes absolutely Uh, So thanks so much for having me. And uh, I can't wait to meet you in person and and the event. uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Ditto. Ditto. All right, Jake. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Good night. I want to thank Jay Wexler for joining us today. We will be doing a book signing with Jay for his book, Weed Rules, May 11th from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the Avon Pop Bookstore. We hope you can join us. The theme music for Avant Pop Bookstore Presents is performed by artist Dilla Shu. And I hope you can join us again for another edition of Avant Pop Bookstore Presents.